Okay. Greetings, everybody. Hello, uh, those of you watching now and to those of you who will be catching this later. I am Mr. Patriarch, and I am joined tonight by Dr. Paul Gottfried, and we'll be discussing his book, Fascism, the Career of a Concept. Uh, for those of you who may know, I have been working on a multi-part video series on fascism, largely inspired by uh, Dr. Gottfried's book, which I rely on heavily for my video series. And uh, I figured it would be just the thing, the crowning touch if I could talk to the man himself, <laughs> to sort of flesh out some of these ideas and some of the areas I was not so sure on. So Dr. Gottfried has graciously joined us today. Um, if you are new, please uh, subscribe to Mr. Patriarch, this channel that you're watching this on. And I will begin here in just a second. Uh, Dr. Gottfried is a professor emeritus at Elizabethtown College, and as he likes to call himself, a historian of ideas, which I think is quite apt. How are you doing today, sir? I am doing fine. Tremendous. Yeah, I'm doing. I'm doing pretty good as well. Just uh, whew. it's sundown right now, and the sun's coming in <laughs> through the windows, and it's you know that African sun. It's whew. you should come here. It's very balmy. It's about seventy-five degrees, and I was raking late leaves before you uh, leaves are oh. falling now. Uh, oh, true. Before I came on the show. <laughs> Oh man! So, and, and you're in uh, Pennsylvania, is that correct? Yes. Okay. So yeah, 75 degrees. That is actually that is pretty hot. I guess my my main gripe right now is just the the location of the sun because right around this time it just starts beaming right in at me. And this is kind of where my office is, and I work from home, so it's every day I, I feel like I'm walking into Mordor <laughs> around this time. <laughs> All right. So uh, today, as I've said before. Uh, we'll be discussing Dr. Dr. Paul Gottfried's book, Fascism, the Career of a Concept. Now, I had first heard of Paul Gottfried, quick backstory for myself. I, uh, my, my trajectory, I was kind of a, you know, growing up in Alaska, it's, it's a very red state. So I was kind of what you could call just sort of a normie conservative, one of the deplorables, you might say. Um, and, you know, I absorbed the politics of the people around me. And which was necessarily what we could call marginal conservative or neoconservative. So, but without consciously going with the radical stuff, Conser because as Paul Gottfried has explained many times, conservatism as we know it in the popular conception is basically been largely warped by conservative ink. And so, you know, that was just, that was the air I breathed. It's like asking a fish, you know, what he thinks about water. So that was me for a long time. And then I became a libertarian for quite a number of years. And then I went and became an ANCAP. <laughs> and uh, while an anarcho-capitalist, I was a big fan of the Tom Woods show. And I still enjoy Tom Woods show. And on that, on a certain episode, I heard Dr. Paul Gottfried talk about his newly released book at the time, Fascism, the Career of a Concept. And I found it interesting. <clears throat> And then, um, as things would have it, uh, reading more of his material, sort of living life more, getting out of university, I slowly became more and more reactionary with time and basically abandoned libertarianism. <laughs> so, as happens. But uh, Dr. Gottfried's uh, interview with Tom Woods, which I would still recommend, it was done a number of years ago, but you can find it on YouTube or on TomWoods.com, and it does a very good brief sort of summarization of his book. And um, <clears throat> the thing that I found really interesting about it is it had mentioned many things to me that I simply did not know about fascism. I thought fascism and Nazism were synonymous, when it turns out they're not at all. <laughs> so I guess, just as an example, so I guess without further ado, Dr. Gottfried, my first question for you is what prompted you to write this book? Yeah, what, what prompted me to write this book, I, I might say, is that my own family were refugees from the Nazis. Um, uh, but at, at the same time, I found myself attracted to Latin fascists. I thought they were interesting people, French, Italian fascists, uh, the Spanish Falange. Um, and, you know, even some people on the German right who were eliminated by the Nazis, I, I found them uh, 
uh, to be uh, people who wanted a conservative revolution, I found them to be uh, to be interesting and worth studying. Uh, let, let let me uh, uh, sort of indicate where I'm coming from methodologically and philosophically. Um, for want of a better term, I might describe myself or have described myself as a right wing historicist. Um, by this, I mean, um, you know, I, I'm willing to look at other ages without imposing the political correctness, a woke capitalism, or whatever is now the dominant lunatic paradigm. It seems lunatic to me, um, <clears throat> and try to understand other societies the way they might have understood themselves, while at the same time recognizing a distance, a cultural distance, an existential distance that you can never bridge fully. <clears throat> um, uh, this does not make me a relativist. I mean, to use the term that the Straussians, on whom I wrote a critical book, um, uh, would you know would apply to people who are self-described historicists. It means that I try to examine um, situations historically um, and in terms of the age and the dominant assumptions of the age in which the people I'm studying or these historical actors might have lived. Um, uh, what I suppose makes me a right-wing historicist um, is, I, A, I do not want to apply the present standards, uh, which I reject myself, <laughs> uh, to earlier ages. Uh, and, you know, I am sympathetic to most traditional societies, even if I would not necessarily care to live in them, particularly the, uh, the low level of hygiene and the likelihood that I'd have a plague, <laughs> you know, if I lived several yeah. centuries earlier. Um, yeah, yeah, but, you know, the, uh, uh, as you know, although I probably would describe myself and I do in my book after liberalism as a kind of 19th century bourgeois liberal, not a libertarian, but a liberal, um, and I believe in constitutional government, uh, I believe in checks and balances on government and so forth. Um, I am very much attracted to counter revolutionaries. I think, uh, their critical perceptions were generally correct. I think most of them were brilliant thinkers, whether it was Mestre, um, Albrecht von Haller in Germany, Savigny, uh, Edmund Burke, uh, their Spanish and Italian and Russian counterparts um, were all brilliant people. And many of their insights turned out to Donoso Cortez may have been a Catholic fanatic, uh, but he understood the direction in which uh, his age was moving quite, quite well uh, and sort of understood, although he may have predated it, there would be some kind of apocalyptic uh, confrontation between between modernism and traditional society, uh, he was correct. Uh, so uh, I suppose this makes me right wing. The, the the fact that I have uh, what Germans would call Einfühlungsvermögen, a kind of you know willingness to look inside <laughs> these societies, and my sympathies are generally with the right. Um, uh, although you know I I'm quite willing to look at other uh, other. Um, historical experiences in their own terms. And anybody who reads me knows I'm not particularly anti-Marxist. Um, I've known Marx. I'm very sympathetic to some of these people uh, intellectually. I think there were brilliant thinkers like Karl Kautsky and um, other Marxists at the beginning of the century. Uh, on the other hand, I have utter contempt for the contemporary LGBT woke uh, left. I think they're, they're, they're vicious, totalitarian, and thoroughly anti-intellectual. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I suppose I'm all over the place. Um, uh, I am not a libertarian at all philosophically, though, um, you know, I generally agree with libertarians about, uh, bringing down the managerial state. Uh, <laughs> I, I have no problems with their call to destroy the present order, uh, if that were possible. Uh, I became interested in, 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 in fascism, particularly early fascism, um, and the people who influenced it, uh, again, because I thought that they were sort of intellectually provocative. Uh, they said very, they said very interesting things. Um, and they were, the lo they were the losers historically. Um, my, my late friend, John Lukacs said, you know, Mussolini was brilliant. Lenin was stupid because, uh, you know, nationalism is much, uh, nationalism will always uh, trump uh, internationalism or socialism. Things really haven't worked out that way. Um, I think I think the globalists are on top, um, uh, and you know I'm not I'm not quite sure that nationalism works outside of small countries with relatively homogeneous populations. 
Um, but it, but again, the fascists, fascists uh, have an interesting reaction to the revolutionary internationalist left, uh, which is revolutionary nationalism. Um, and in the end, it doesn't work out, and it gets uh, shanghaied by the uh, the Nazis, who absorb elements of fascism and Stalinism just as much, um, and uh, you know pull most of the fascists into uh, the fascists into their orbit, along with Nazi collaborators. Uh, mm-hmm. And as I point out in a book that I just finished on anti-fascism, anti-fascism becomes the dominant theme um, of the present age politically and culturally, even though it has less and less to do with historical fascism. Mm. Oh, that's an excellent point. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's funny. After having read your book and studied this stuff, uh, I remember in sort of the circles, you know, in, in the South African context, it's one of those things where you hang with who you can against the ANC, basically. <laughs> so if that, so if, so the it, people here who are basically versions of you know, the Democrats in the year 2000, you're like, oh, they're just the very absolute voice of reason compared to some of the, <laughs> compared to some of the things you encounter here. And uh, a libertarian acquaintance of mine was <clears throat> uh, criticizing uh, Julius Malema, who's uh, the party head of the EFF, the Economic Freedom Fighters, which is basically a, a Leninist, a pseudo Leninist party with with black nationalism, <laughs> and and he was criticizing and he was criticizing Malema as fascist. And I was after and after hearing that, I was like, oh, if only, <laughs> if only you were fascist, basically. <laughs> yeah, and I was sort of inspired by uh, again having having read read up on some of this stuff. Um, so I guess sort of the natural question that a lot of people have uh, is in what ways is fascism distinct from other authoritarian regimes? Yeah, uh, the uh, the historian Stanley Payne, who's now well in his 80s, and I think is really the dean of, you know, fascist studies, um, has uh, has made, you know, the argument that uh, uh, we say ordinary um, vanilla authoritarianism, whatever you want to call it, is different from from fascism, and you know makes makes I think uh, critical distinctions. Uh, the fascists uh, are revolutionary nationalists; they claim to be introducing a national revolution, whereas you know an authoritarian leader like Franco or Salazar is simply trying to keep the lid on the pot. You know, uh, you're trying to hold down the left, uh, which is not the same as what the fascists are doing. They claim to be creating a new order with a corporate economy, which is corporatist economy, which is often uh, fake. You know, it doesn't really change very much. And here, the, here the Marxists are correct, um, but you know, it appeals to national symbols, national antiquities, and so forth. There, there is a more interesting question, you know, that I've never been able to answer for myself satisfactorily. Um, are, are black nationalists? fascist um and you know someone like uh Gre- what's his name um uh james gregor the one who writes yeah, james all- Aker, yeah. right who writes all these it was, it was a very bright man who writes all these books on africans as fascist uh maintains that you know all of these uh these african uh, authoritarian leaders are the heirs to giovanni gentile and benito mussolini and they're sort of you know, do, doing the same thing in Africa. Um, I reject that in my book on fascism. I don't think that's true. Um, you know, I, I, th- I think they're, they're African authoritarian leaders who sort of borrow things, you know, some of the trappings from various Western movements, including communism, right? So uh, I, uh, the, 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 the other point that I, I would make um, is that fascism is an interwar European movement. Uh, you know, you cannot take it out of its historical context, this is what I argue, and say that anything which shows authoritarian or national features is fascism. Uh, you know, uh, or, you know, the, the, the argument now is anyone who's an anti-Semite is a fascist. Really? You know, you have anti-Semites in the 11th century. Are they fascists? Were they ancient Romans? <laughs> <laughs> this is utter nonsense. You know? yeah. 
It's anyone you don't like is fascist, which means anyone you don't like is Hitler. This is, you know, I said that this is this is what the the equation has now come down to. It's just utterly ridiculous. It's just a, uh, you know, it's it's just uh, a demagogic rhetorical point that these people are making. Or, um, but then you then you get another problem uh, that you do have black supporters of Mussolini. Uh, the Back to Africa movement uh, adored Mussolini, you know, until he. Uh, Till he attacked Ethiopia because they worshipped Pal Selassie, you know, was the uh, the uh, mm. emperor there. But the um, uh, you did have African. You you had Zionist supporters of Mussolini, right wing Zionists adored Mussolini. They trained their troops, you know, in fascist Italy. Um, the qu- the qu- the question is, you know, are uh, were these Zionists or African nationalist fascists? And I'm not going to say they were fascists, but there's a closer kinship there. Uh, since they identify themselves with the, the Italian fascist movement. Uh, there is a, uh, a fascist international uh, which meets in Montreux uh, in uh, Switzerland, I think in 1936 or 1937. Uh, um, and these are fascist international from all these countries, Irish fascists. This. Now, uh, you can't say all of them wanted to exterminate Jews or anything like this, but they were, you know, nor did Mussolini. Um, but they, they were, uh, they were fascist in the sense that they saw the Italian fascist model as something they wished to imitate. So, I mean, there, there, there is a kind of direct kinship. Uh, but just to assign fascist labels to any authoritarian third world leader, um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that's justified. Yeah, no, I would agree. Um, Speaking just sort of in the um, South Africa context, yeah, just if you take a character like Julius Malema uh, and try and label him as fascist, uh, there's just too many ways in which I believe he doesn't fit the fascist mold. For one thing, he basically wants Soviet-style command economy. Mm -hmm. And also the racial nationalism not cultural nationalism. So it's not like Zulu nationalism or Kosa, Kosa nationalism. I got to get my clicks right. <laughs> or uh, Afrikaner nationalism or anything like that. It's, it's, it's racial nationalism. Um, and in that way, it's, it, 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 it's, it's very, it's somewhat distinct from fascist phenomenon. So fascism, as I understand it, the nationalist aspect was, was ethnic and not racial. And the economic structure, although corporatist, was not sort of, you know, Stalinist, <laughs> basically. It, it, not, it was not only not Stalinist, but fascist Italy, up until the Salo Republic, which the Germans bring into existence, and as the fascist extremist running it, um, uh, it is much less socialist than probably the United States was at the time. Certainly, uh, it does not compare to... Uh, to act Clement Attlee's England after the Labour government after the second, which is which really is authoritarian socialism at its worst. Yeah. Uh, although we say, oh, it's nice, it's democratic. You know, we like them. They're they're dem- they had an election. We voted for it, so it's okay. <laughs> Who voted for it? Oh, I was just saying we voted for it, so it's okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. That, that's the idea. We vo- we voted for it. as long as it's on the left and we vote for it. It's 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 uh, obviously the uh, legitimate. But that that's an important question. I think you've raised. Um, where do you put black racial nationalists? Supposedly, the left is internationalist. It's globalist, like the woke capitalist, and you know uh, uh, some of the the communists. Where, where do you put these people? Um, and I, I, I would say they are uh, associated with the left. The left are all their allies, right? Uh, they also hate yeah. white people, which seems to be characteristic of the left right now, right. including the white people who run the left, you know, use anti-white <laughs> propaganda for their own advantage. Um, uh, but, you know, I, you really can't say, but, but racial nationalism is really not uh, a characteristic of the left. Uh, and you know th- this really doesn't fit into anything very easily, uh, unless you lo- you lo- you say you point out as I as I do in my book on anti-fascism that uh, stylistically um, or procedurally they behave like Nazis, uh, like the brown shirts. They're committed to violence. Uh, 
nihilistic destruction and so forth, um, and kind of all out hatred of the group that they're going after. Um, so they are, they are, they, they behave, there's a kind of psychology, which is similar to that of the Nazis. Um, however, I, I would not equate them since obviously the Nazis believe in Aryan superiority, you know, whereas they believe in blacks and they're on the opposite yeah, yeah. side, <laughs> right? So, uh, and they hate white people. Um, so they, the, 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 the fact, the fact that they're practicing total socialism uh, would not necessarily mean they don't fit into the fascist or at least the Nazi model. Um, but uh, uh, the, uh, the the collectivism, by the way, was was condemned by Mussolini. You know, he condemned uh, atheistic collectivism or godless collectivism. But he sounded yeah. like, you know, post-World War II cold warriors. You know? <laughs> godless <laughs> collectivism, I love that. He said, you know, we're not really, we're not really collectivist, although he started out as a socialist. So uh, and I said fascism is sort of like, like ornamental socialism <laughs> at most. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I think, and, you know, of course, of course, you know, Anybody who is, uh, how would I say, uh, politically correct or a little too sensitive, uh, you know, hearing us sort of compare, uh, I guess, Julius Malema to a sort of a brown shirt phenomenon, a national socialist phenomenon, be able to say, oh, that's just hyperbole. But I think you are right in the sense that there is a certain, if, if you look at historical movements, that were not ethnic nationalists, but racial nationalists, and also had this sort of militarist aesthetic coupled with the, you know, willful destruction and, you know, desire to just, you know, take the land and burn the farms down and stuff. Um, that you, you really don't see that sort of phenomenon in uh, Italian fascism at all. Um, and, also, even though it's Marxist it, in terms of its economics, the racial angle and the racial nationalism part of it uh, doesn't really fit well within the left either. So it's kind of its own thing in the same way that I would say kind of national socialism is. Uh -huh. And I guess that sort of brings me to, I, I was thinking about asking this a little bit later, but we'll, we'll, we'll do it now, I guess. Uh, in what ways was fascism distinct uh, from Nazism? Because I believe you, I heard you say in, a, in an old interview you gave at the Mises Institute some years ago, uh, I think you said that uh, fascism has about as much to do with Nazism as Swedish social democracy has with Stalinism. <laughs> so uh, could you elaborate on that a bit further? Yeah, I, I, think, I think it's a good comparison because if you look at Swedish social democrats, they always leaned politically toward the Soviets. You know, there was like a, a kind of tropism because the Soviets were socialist. Uh, they never really took the side of the United States uh, unless you really twisted their arm. Uh, there, there, wa there was an affinity, you know, to the, to the East Bloc among many, many of the Swedish socialists. Um, uh, and, but, you know, they, they did not nationalize the entire economy uh, they nationalized very little of the economy, actually. It was just the taxation that was absolutely onerous. <laughs> they didn't want to yeah. Confiscatory uh, tax yeah, rates, the, yeah. The, uh, uh, the, the comparison of these, of these black nationalists uh, to the Nazis, I think, is entirely appropriate. Uh, the Nazis are not, uh, are not really part of, the, of, the, of any traditional right. Uh, and the brown shirts hated capitalists. Um, they hated the monarchy. I mean, this business that somehow the Nazis are a continuation of the second is ridiculous. Uh, Hitler uh, despised Kaiser Wilhelm. Uh, uh, the, uh, they might have something nice about Bismarck because he helped unify, unify the country. But these people really were nihilistic, hateful revolutionaries engaging in violence. They remind me very much of the black nationalists. And as I say, they remind me of Black Lives Matter and Antifa. Uh, in the United States, um, and and by the way, on this question, this question of Antifa, I find or or the uh, when when Joe Biden says they're only an idea, I mean this is a contemptible statement. They're running around murdering people. It's an idea, and and the 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 Democratic media, you know, uh, uh, support him on this. It's an idea. 
or I, I see this this lady on television two days ago on this uh, uh, this insipid uh, Martha Callum program on Fox News. This person is an undecided. There's this heavy set woman with a big Black Lives Matter shirt. She's an undecided. You know, uh, it's like seeing someone with a swat stick. You know, this is, but that can't decide who you're going to vote for. I mean, what are you telling me? Uh, no, I think these. I think if we had a serious conservative movement in this country, rather than people triangulating with the left, kissing up to. Uh, uh, their counterparts uh, on the center left and uh, kicking out everybody to the right of themselves. If you had a serious conservative movement, they would be attacking Black Lives Matter and Antifa, you know, as Nazi lookalikes, which was what I think they are. They are very destructive. They're murderous and they're full of hatred. Uh, and they're not generic fascist uh, or generic nationalists or anything like that. Um, so I, I think the comparison to the Nazis is fine. Uh, but what makes the Nazis, I suppose, a bit, well, a bit different is they borrow a bit more from the generic fascists. Um, and, uh, you know, they, uh, uh, they turn, you know, Latinity into uh, Arianism or something like that. But they have the uniforms, they have the Duce, you know, you have the uh, Hitler as, uh, uh, as uh, de Führer. So, I mean, there's, there's, this, is, this is the continuity. And then they had the honor guards and this. By the way, the Italian fascist load the Nazis until they made an alliance with them because they thought that these were German barbarians. You know, we conquered them once, you know, <laughs> and they were fit to govern themselves. Caesar they was right. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, the, the, even though they make some sort of alliance with the church, the, the fascists are essentially neo-pagan. They're, they're Roman pagans. They want to go back to Romanitas. Uh, and they despise Hitler and they despise the Germans. And this becomes a problem even when the, uh, I'm reading this biography of Rippentrop and they're trying to make an alliance. And he says, you know, they hate us. The, the, the fascists hate us. They consider us to be inferior <laughs> or something. <laughs> this is like in 1938, they're still saying this. Wow, that's hilarious. And you know, and it's it's little things like these, which, and, and fortunately for me, like I was, I grew up in a, you know, conservative kind of evangelical Christian household and I was homeschooled. So I sort of missed a lot of the, you know, the kind of stuff that you'd get in public uh, schooling as far as, uh, ed as, as, far as, as far as history goes. But um, even I was kind of, it was just, I, I didn't even know to look just the, the level of uh, animus between the Italian fascists and the German national socialists was real until, you know, of course, for, uh, we could you could speculate maybe maybe Mussolini was scared that he'd get the Dolphus treatment or mm. <laughs> or you know maybe he saw it as an opportunity he's like all right they're going to be on top we might as well be on the winning side but uh, initially yeah there was definitely bad blood uh, I have a question here from a viewer it says but didn't Hitler hate Wilhelm because he abdicated is that true that that is. Um... That is correct. I, th I don't know if this person has read my work, but I, I think there is um, uh, there 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 is a long uh, history throughout at least through the Weimar Republic um, of German nationalists uh, and even some of the socialists and the Democrats um, rejecting Kaiser Wilhelm because he abdicated um, uh -huh. and because he did not fight, you know, uh, against what became the Treaty of Versailles. You sort of uh, the, the people, by the way, who were left to sign that treaty were all decent people. Uh, they really, they really had their backs against the wall. Uh, and the reality is that the German military, people like Hindenburg and Ludendorff, managed uh, managed to blame this, you know, on the civilian government. They collapsed. <laughs> the, the German military actually collapsed uh, at one point um, toward toward the end of the war. Um, and the civilian government was sort of left trying to negotiate a treaty. They gave them, you know, sort of respectable, decent terms that would not have left Germany in such a tattered, dismembered condition at the end of the war. Um, but the fact that Wilhelm abdicates is, although he does this being pushed by Wilhelm Gröner, uh, who was a military leader who, who uh, uh, was a very decent man, <laughs> actually, he thinks we have no choice. Um, the abdication of Wilhelm is, is, is sort of interesting because uh, it was pushed by the, this is pushed by Woodrow Wilson, 
The French couldn't even care, or the British couldn't care less. They just wanted to tear Germany apart. They didn't care if it was an emperor or whoever was left in charge. You know, they were just in favor of, of dismembering and wrecking Germany. Whereas uh, Wilson, who was, as I say, a proto-neoconservative, hated the, the monarchy. He wanted them to have a democracy or something like, like uh, you know, his kind of democracy, perhaps one that would exclude blacks from voting the way Wilson wanted to do in the United States. But, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they sort of push this, um, they push this on. But Wilhelm does go, he just leaves. Uh, and uh, uh, not only Hitler, but a lot of other people thought that this was, this was really bad. But, but Hitler also hated uh, the, um, uh, what he called, you know, the, um, uh, die Philistine Monarchy, the, the Philistine, mo Philistine Monarchy, um, uh, or die Spiel Spießbürgerlich, another German word. It was like totally Philistine bourgeois, um, uh, under, under the Second Empire. It was not a true revolutionary government that he, of a kind uh -huh. that he wanted to establish. He, so, uh, this is absolutely true. I mean, if you, uh, you know, if you read Hitler's, you know, correspondence, so what he despises the monarchy, uh, he despises it culturally. And of course, like all of these other, now he holds it against Wilhelm that he, that he, you know, he abdicated and ran to Holland. Mm, okay. So that's an interesting point. So yes, <laughs> it's kind of like damned if you do, damned if you don't with the Fuhrer basically. So yeah. hey, you were, you were basically a weenie for abdicating. And I also hate you for not being radical enough. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> okay, interesting. So um, one aspect uh, that I was totally unaware of until a couple months ago when I was reading through your book was the you you, you trace um, kind of the origins of fascism to uh, the post-revolutionary French right. Uh, could you just uh, go into that a little bit for us? Yeah, there is a large scholarship produced by a Francophone Israeli scholar, uh, Zev Sternhill, who, by wow. the way, is is a brilliant scholar, research scholar, but it is a uh, but it's a totalitarian, anti-fascist maniac. But <laughs> his scholarship can be trusted. One of one of one of these sort of uh, brilliant Marxists that you were talking about earlier on, basically. Well, he's not a Marxist. <laughs> he's not a Marxist. Yeah. He's just a kind of uh, you know contemporary anti-fascist uh, lunatic, or he was. Uh, but he's a brilliant scholar, and th there's nothing questionable about his scholarship that I can find. And in some of his uh, his works on what is it, ni droite ni gauche, neither right nor left, and uh, uh, the uh, the revolution, uh, the nationalisme révolutionnaire, or something, he's he is very very uh, 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 very thorough in the way he shows. Um, uh, the way he shows the um, the development of fascism um, at a French and a tap, but mostly French ideas that develop in the Third Republic. He has a very good biography of Maurice Barrez, uh, who founds a kind of French national socialist movement in the 1870s. Uh, and m much of this far right, or uh, this nationalist right in France, is a reaction against the Franco-Prussian War. It's anti-German. It's strongly mm. uh, a Germanophobe. You know, the Germans have to be totally crushed. They're the traditional enemies of the French and so forth. Uh, and it stresses Latinity. This is an important element. Um, I, have a bio I have a long essay on this in my book on um, uh, revisions and descents. You know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, obviously the Action Francaise has an influence on this um, uh, Charles Maras who are, or they're very anti-German, they're fanatically anti-German, but, you know, their attempt to appeal to a kind of integral national identity uh, or to build an entire, you know, religious, aesthetic, political movement around nationalism um, very definitely influences. The Another important thinker is obviously Sorel with his reflections on violence, uh, which was, you know, read by, as a Bible by the early Italian um uh, fascist. My, uh, my now dead friend, uh, uh, Jack Roth, did a book on Sorel and his influence on Italian fascism. So uh, Sternhell is not the only one writing on, on the subject. Uh, in fact, there was a German Nazi in the 1930s who did a book on what German Nazism owed to the French 
left, uh, the French right of the 1870s and 1880s. So th this really becomes very much of a kind of breeding ground um, for um, uh, for later for later fascist uh, thinking. <clears throat> Interesting. And uh, George Sorrell, was, was he the guy who came up with the idea of, um, is it called redemptive violence or something like that? Yes. Okay. Well, no, the, the term he uses is, is the redemptive, the uh, redemptive myth, the uh, le mythe redempteur, the redemptive myth that, you know, the myth isn't necessarily true, but it organizes people for heroic action. You know, mm. and his model is the early Christians, you know, that they were uh, they had this myth of redemption, you know, which held them together and they finally triumphed over their enemies. OK, interesting. So <clears throat> now one thing that I in, I have come across over the past few years is this term of clerical fascism and they'll, and also People will try to lump regimes like Salazar's uh, Estado Novo or um, Franco's Spain as being uh, fascist. Um, and I was just wondering, to what extent was Portugal under Salazar, Austria under Dolphus, or Franco, Franco Spain, to what extent did they fit or not fit the fascist mold? Yeah, the, the, the model for clerical fascism is Austrofascismus, Austrian fascism under Dolphus. The problem is that Dolphus is not a fascist. You know, he's sort of mm -hmm. a, uh, um, an authoritarian leader who spends most of his time fighting the Nazis who are trying to, then they kill him. Um, and he had the support of Ludwig von Mises, you know, uh, in Austria. Um, he does make an alliance with the Catholic Church uh, one of the, the leaders of what had been the Volkspartei, the People's Populist Party, Ignaz Zeipel, was a, uh, was, was a clergyman. He was a Catholic priest. Um, and this alliance against the Marxist socialists becomes, you know, sort of second nature by the time Dolphus takes over in the 1930s. Um, uh, his successor, Kurt Schuschnigg, who is, um, destroy, you know, destroy, he was forced into exile, lands up teaching at St. Louis University. Uh, he also is an, is an Austro-fascist or clerical fascist. Uh, and they apply this term to themselves, but I mean, you have to be a total fool um, or a crazy German or Austrian anti-fascist today to imagine that Dolphus is a fascist uh, or that clerical fascism is fascism. Uh, it is simply an improvisation to fight both the Nazis and the uh, the Marxist socialists on the left, uh, Sal Salazar is a very devout Catholic uh, who's influenced. Uh, I don't know. I suppose by uh, by Thomistic economics or neo Catholic neo corporatism or something like that. Uh, yeah. He basically runs a caretaker government in Portugal for many years and tries to deal not very successfully with the economic problems of the country. Um, he is not particularly, a th you know, he just, he's just there until he has a stroke and then dies. Um, and, you know, th then he's replaced for a while by Caetano and then, uh, then the left just takes over. Um, uh, in the case of Franco, he builds an alliance uh, with the church, among other groups. Uh, he does not start out, by the way, as any kind of clericalist. Um, he takes an oath to support the lay republic uh, in Spain. Um, but then once the left starts running around murdering priests and burning down churches, uh, this becomes a perfect, you know, okay, the church becomes a perfect ally and he stays with them <laughs> um, and uh, be becomes very much of a clericalist uh, for many years. For instance, uh, although he allows Jews to worship in uh, Spain because they're somehow seen as, as even though they're kicked out, they're seen as Spanish. He does not allow Protestants to establish a church because they are a Catholic heresy. <laughs> <laughs> really? Really? I did not know that. Yeah. Although, <laughs> well, my friend, my friend allowed, Scott would love it. Yeah, he allowed American Protestants to worship in their embassy or something like that. <laughs> How devout a Catholic he is, I don't know. But he does play oh the Christmas card uh, for many years. Then he finally gives up on this in the 60s and then, or the 70s. I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know. My, my, uh, my one-time mentor and friend, Will Herberg, had been in Spain 
And uh, I, I don't know, this, this must have been like the 1970s. And he said that, you know, Protestants were still forced, forced to worship in people's houses. They couldn't have public <laughs> churches. So this was in the 1970s under Franco. <clears throat> wow, that's really interesting. <laughs> uh, just this, this comment, Protestants disavowed. <laughs> yeah, I guess. All right. <laughs> that's funny. Okay, so um, now... <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm, just, I'm still laughing at that. <laughs> I mean, who it would like, here? <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's hilarious. I mean, <laughs> it's basically like the, the Christianity in China today, but <laughs> but only for Protestants. <laughs> All right, so um, I guess uh, so one one of the things I was thinking about, and in in sort of the latest video of mine, I was kind of trying to look at in terms of day-to-day -day governing, right? So I know that um, uh, like uh, Austria or Portugal, uh, Portugal was interested in sort of keeping on to the empire that they already had. And uh, Austria was sort of, in, uh, you know, no interested in sort of preserving their, in their, their territory and whatnot, but weren't really uh, interested in expanding beyond it, right? So they weren't like, imperialists in the way that you would think of yeah as um you know Mussolini for example and that appears to be sort of one of the key differences um with these uh clerical fascists or the uh Salazar's Portugal or Spain mm -hmm. is they they they're not particularly expansionist or expansionist at all and the other thing that is different is that they appear to lack the, uh, the the fascist ideology. So this this kind of religious sort of cult of the state that Gen Gentile and uh, Mussolini sort of create to talk about the state, that, that appears to be entirely absent from these other regimes. Well, but, in, the, in, the, in the case of Spain, they, um, uh, Franco does make an alliance with the Falange, which is a Spanish fascist organization, um, but it's mostly symbolic and the, the uh, the, the Falangistas who survived the war, but a lot of them are just killed off at the beginning by the left, um, are given mostly ornamental positions. And if they make any problems, they're just thrown out. <laughs> <They're just exiled. laughs> okay. So he doesn't take this very seriously. Uh, Franco is interested, however, in picking up Gibraltar. And he negotiates with both sides in the Second World War. Uh, and he's even thinking of getting back a little more of Morocco for Spain. Uh, but I don't think this represents, you know, serious imperialism of any kind. Right. Not like, not like the invasion of Ethiopia or anything no, quite like that. No, like that. <laughs> yeah. So, but in terms of the day-to-day -day governance, life on the ground for the average Italian compared to the average Portuguese or Spaniard, um, I could be wrong, but to me, it doesn't seem like there was a whole lot of difference particularly and that they were interested in kind of so what they had in common all these regimes is that they were single party states authoritarian or in the case of franco spain you know an, uh, a military dictatorship essentially um and they often seem to employ some kind of corporatist or pseudo corporatist economic right. system and Sometimes they had a sort of military aesthetic, um, but the uh, apart from the uh, ideology of the state and normative fascism, uh, there doesn't seem to be a tremendous amount of difference. Not uh, compared to like uh, what if you were to compare like one of those regimes with uh, you know, like a modern liberal democracy, or if you were to compare that regime to like. Uh, Stalinism, for example. Uh, to what extent would you say that's the, the, the case or true? I, I think that it's probably not all that true. This is what someone like Stanley Payne might point out. Um, if you, through most of Franco's regime, uh, he was uh, he was not even, you didn't even see him. Uh, the same thing with Salazar. People didn't see him for years, you know, and there was sort of some kind of mild authoritarianism that existed, it was sort of a one party state. Then it opens up to other parties. Uh, if you're sort of comparing it to anything, it would be Bonapartism. 
you know, in the 1850s and 1860s in France. It sort of gradually liberalizes, um, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, th there's not much of a movement behind it. And you have nothing like the cult of the Duce in Italy, although, you know, uh, uh, Franco is hailed as the Codillo, but this is, you know, the phalangist who give, give him this title. But then he began, uh, I, I had a friend who was visiting Spain in the late 1960s who said he wanted, he admired Franco, he was such a very right-wing Catholic. And he said, I want a picture of this man. And he said, you couldn't find it even in the post office. This is <laughs> <laughs> so it's almost like an invisible government. You know, it's sort of like, uh, you know, the communist governments in Eastern Europe, as they were going, disappearing or something. Um, he didn't see very much. All the personality <laughs> score, zero. There's no personality <laughs> cult, whatever. Um, so, you know, it becomes less and less of a, pre and, uh, and, it, and it the, the, one of the things about the Italian fascist, it becomes more fascist. Like in the 1920s, it isn't much of a, fa then in the 1930s, I mean, you know, we're going to have more of a corporatist economy, although a lot of it is just for show. Um, uh, we, um, uh, we, we, we're going to have a more of a fascist ideology. We're going to stress the ideological component. And we're going to have, you know, a uh, doctrina del fascismo, the doctrine of fascism, put into some kind of, people are going to learn this in school. The schools are going to teach this and so forth. So it, it, become, it becomes really a kind of almost showcase fascism in Italy in the 1930s. Whereas if you look at Spain and Portugal, it becomes more and more of a vestigial government. <laughs> Like going away, and you know they, uh, and they try to make themselves more, you know, scarcer and scarcer, uh, and then they sort of like open it up. In the case of Spain, uh, during the Cold War, they accept an American alliance. It becomes country becomes more Americanized. Uh, they not only have bases, but then it becomes a big tourist in industry. Everybody's coming to the country, uh, and it becomes harder and harder, I suppose, to keep uh, Protestants from worshiping publicly. So. Uh, <laughs> You know, th th this is sort of a classical, a classical government of the right that you see here. It is essentially a government that tries to keep the left from getting power. I mean, that's mm. what the right is. You try to keep the left. Uh, what makes the Italian fascist different is they're more dynamic. They're creating an alternative, a revolutionary alternative. So you have none of this dynamism, you know, in these traditional authoritarian governments. Okay. Okay. That's interesting. So that, 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 that sort of leads into kind of where I wanted to go next, where it, it appears that there's much to me, at least in sort of my understanding of it, much of sort of what makes fascism distinct from these other uh, traditionalist rightist regimes is that they were it, it's it's kind of the aesthetics of the thing this belief that this sort of uh, shiny milis, militaristic aesthetic this sort of machismo uh, this cult of personality of the leader and this belief that we are a revolutionary force mm -hmm. these sort of aesthetic elements are really uh, that and the corporatism are really kind of what define uh, fascism in large part. What would you say to that? Well, yeah, an, an, that's true. Another important difference, especially between uh, ordinary authoritarian governments of the right uh, and fascism, um, is the fascists have a very uneasy relationship with the Catholic Church. Um, you know, there is the, the Lateran Pact made in 1929 in which Catholicism is accepted as the religion of most of the Italians. Uh, and there'll be some religious instruction that goes on in the school. And they also recognize the, the, uh, the, the Chita Vaticano, the Vatican City is going to be recognized and so forth as, uh, as autonomous. Then immediately they go back to fighting, you know, the, uh, because fascia and, and Giovanni Gentile, who's the great, um, uh, uh, the great doctor of the fascist church, the one who creates its doctrines, and Mussolini turns to him, you know, what do we believe? And he puts all this stuff together. He hates the Catholic church. He sees it as a rival, you know, that we have to create our own religion of fascism. So that mm. uh, uh, this, this is, this is uh, the true fascists believe this. They do not want an alliance with the Catholics. They see the Catholic church as alien 
Uh, whereas, uh, you know, these authoritarian, these Latin authoritarian governments rely heavily on an alliance with the Catholic Church. Yeah, no, that was the thing. So it, it appears like with fascism, there were either, or a lot of the fascists were either ambivalent towards Catholicism or hostile, as you say, and they sort of make an alliance for pragmatic reasons because they, they realize, you know, they have to sort of gain public goodwill and whatnot. But the higher ups, it appears, were never really particularly happy with that. <laughs> there, 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 it's interesting that a lot of the early fascists were Italian Jews, you know, who were certainly anti they were nationalists, they were anti clerical. They, the Catholic Church had persecuted them, um, you know, and Mussolini welcomed them, you know, all the way down to the late 30s when he makes an alliance with Hitler and kicks them all out. Um, but. Uh, you know, the uh, Gentile was allied with these Italian Jews. He had you know, no problem with this. Uh, he went crazy when Mussolini, you know, kicked them out of the, uh, the fascist party. Um, so, you know, the Italian fascism was not, to, it, it was the, the tradition that the fascist ideologues like Gentile emphasize is the Risorgimento. It is the, uh, the liberation of Italy from foreign governments and from the Catholic Church. You know, their, their anti-clericalism is very much up front. The same is true, by the way, about the, the, the Irish fascists, the so-called blue shirts. Uh, they do not want any alliance with the Catholic. They're, they're anti-Catholic, um, uh, just, like just like the Freemasons. <laughs> you know? uh, and of course, the, the Freemasons and the fascists are at war, but they're, they're, both, they're both essentially anti-clerical. Hmm. So that's interesting. So... It, we're getting into something interesting here. So, the the fascism, <clears throat> it's and this 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 I this I guess gets to the big question. So I, I have my own answer, but I like to hear yours. So, is is fascism on the left or the right then? Because the right is traditionally associated, the way I like to think about it, and what I sort of lifted from you is the right is all about hierarchy and accepting inequality as a fact of life. And the, and the fascists are, in a sense, on board with that. But the right is also associated with typically tradition, with uh, religion, and trying to preserve traditional society. So I guess the big question is, in your estimation, is fascism on the right or on the left politically? Yeah, I, I, that's a difficult question. As you know, in the book, I say they're on the right. Uh, whereas the, the Nazis, like the party you're dealing with in South Africa, is uh, you know, more of a problem than where to put them because <laughs> they have yeah. both right, right and left elements. But the, uh, uh, what I say is the fascists are uh, almost, we might say, in a kind of postmodern right. Uh, or mm. you know, uh, when the traditional right is already uh, on decl in decline, uh, it tries to create a new right. It's an artificial right. You know, there's a, there's a German term, uh, eine Kunstrechte, an artificial right. And this, this is what they're engaged in doing. We, we say we're going to have our own hierarchy. They don't totally reject the hierarchy before. I mean, many Italian aristocrats just become integrated into the fact, and they treat them with respect because they're part of the national history. And they, so they're, they're not going to get rid of classes. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> they're just going to, you know, Create now, now that the other one is sort of going away and is associated with the pre nationalist past, they're going to create their own national hierarchy. So, <clears throat> another thing is that they look for their model to the distant past, whereas the left is always creating the future, it's rejecting the past, right? This is what they're doing in America, tearing down statues, everything, right? Uh, this is why the uh, you know, these woke left, the left are the purest left I've ever seen. I mean, they would be. Yeah, <laughs> they really are. Right? They would be, I contrast you know, it to the extreme. I mean, the, the communists look like, you know, extreme clerical reactionaries compared. These are the most extreme yeah. left. And they've been absorbed by both political parties. And they're absorbed by all the parties in Western Europe. They sort of try to uh, try yeah. to accommodate them. Um, but, the, you know, the fascists adore the past. Right. I mean, they, they love those. Uh, the Caesar, the empire. Uh, Romanitas, our Latin heritage, and they even, you know, try to integrate the Catholic Church because it is Italian and because it is Roman, not because they really like what they're doing particularly, but they mm. have this, they're associated with Latin antiquity, uh, whereas those Germans over there are barbarians, you know, they don't, or Slavs, who cares about them, but 
the other Latin people are good, like the Spaniards are fine because they're 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 Latin, and we once ruled over them, right? They were they were you know they were Gauls or something back then. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Carthaginians came in, but we conquered the Carthaginians. I mean, why do they want to take that that Africa? Uh, because remember that uh, we ruled Carthage. We destroyed Carthage, right? <laughs> so they're reclaiming the Roman Empire by taking North Africa. Uh, the the uh, another group that acts in a very similar fashion um, are the uh, the Zionist revisionists who look very much like them, you know, out of which the present Likud party is descended in in Israel. And if you look at the original uh, leader, they sounded very much they, because they came out of the Italian fascist movement. They sounded very similar, you know. Mm. We're going to reclaim the kingdom of of David. We're going to reclaim, you know, he is our true ruler. We're going to go back 3,000 years. And, and re so it is this emphasis on antiquity that I think uh, is uh, uh, a, a feature of the right that you find in, in fascism. It does not look like the 19th century counter-revolutionary right, obviously, uh, hmm. but, but I think it is recognizable as the right. I think you're correct. Um, yeah. No more to say. <laughs> uh, I guess one one thing that um, always gets labeled as fascist, of course, is Nazism. And I guess how would you say the Nazis particularly do not um, fit the fascist mold, sort of specifically? Well, yeah, you know, one of that is their utter brutality. <laughs> you know, I mean, how many people does Mussolini kill? Uh, or, you know, even people killed by his underlings, uh, I think it's like eight or nine or something. It's a very small number. Uh, yeah. The others just sort of flee the country or they set up, you know, uh, exile governments or something. I mean, Hitler, at the end of the day, you know, killed tens of millions of people. I mean, it's like it's like no no comparison. Uh, I think Nazism is sui generis. I think uh, I think the Nazi government is by far the most brutal, vicious government we've ever seen in the West. Stalin may have killed as many people, but he took much longer to do it. Um, now, on the other hand, I don't think the Nazi government is as totalitarian as the communists, because you can leave the country until they start a war, right? Um, and they leave most of the economy, at least, you know, the part of the economy that was not controlled by Jews or enemies, they thought enemies of the state, they leave it free. You know, they're, they're, not, as, they're not as totalitarian as the communists, but they certainly kill a lot of people. And they start. And they and they start a lot of wars. Um, uh, the the Italian fascist government, were it not for the Nazis, would be looked upon sort of as a curiosity. You know, some uh, sort of give the Italians some local color. Or I mean, it does not really strike me as, as some kind of monstrosity. Um, German Nazism is, uh, and if you notice in my comments, I find these attempts to equate. Uh, Nazis with the Confederacy or with the Sejermen, I find they're obscene. I mean, why are people even allowed to get away with this nonsense? Um, and the people who are doing it um, are, I think, understating the evils of the Nazi government. Um, and, uh, you know, I, it, it bar I, I think it borrows more heavily from Stalin, by the way, than it does from Mussolini. The, the, the extermination camps, all this stuff comes from the Russians. The totalitarian model is not Italian fascism. It's it's uh, it's, the, it's the Soviet model. They take over. Um, there's and I think it was Hannah Arendt who first points this out. There's a lot of borrowing, uh, and that uh, that they engage in, but it's it's mostly for mostly mostly the Soviet model, uh, uh, the Stalinist model, which the Soviets tried to assimilate. The uh, most of the window dressing though comes from Italian. It's just window dressing comes from Italian fascism. Yeah, no, that that appears to be the case. Uh, they they sort of borrow the fascist aesthetic, right? So they right. look like fascists, but when you like, as you say, the the forced labor camps, the extermination camps, uh, the mass pur the the party purges, uh, the putting down of rivals violently, the mass killings, and the existence also of uh, the Gestapo as as sort of analogous to the Chika or the NKVD. Right. Right. Um, these these are things that um, you, you really don't see in the um, normative fascism. Uh, and I guess that sort of gets to the, the other point is that um, fa fascism and anti-Semitism 
uh, by no means are destined to sort of go hand in hand. Uh, so the only real place that I sort of saw a lot of um, anti-Semitism in fascism was with the Romanian Iron Guard. Uh, but with them, it seemed, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed that their anti-Semitism was less like a, it was less Nazi style in the sense that it wasn't racial. It seemed to be more cultural. Is that is that correct or wrong? So it's it's sort of more like kind of classic prejudice, <laughs> classic anti-Semitism, but just sort of amped up and given this revolutionary fervor that become makes it particularly violent. Yeah, you know, in, in the conference in Montreux in the 1930s, um, they were trying to define the essential elements of fascism. And the Romanians uh, who were present um, uh, insisted that we make anti-Semitism an essential element. And some of the others didn't even know what they were talking about, like blue shirts and iron. <laughs> <laughs> what do you care? <laughs> you know? uh, so, I mean, it was, it was uh, uh, Mussolini had many, they were trying to go fascist internationally and people outside of Europe who thought of themselves as fascist as, as, as well. So, uh, they they, it, they agreed that uh, it would be seen in some countries as an element, but not, you know, would not be universally present in fascism. Um, the, uh, the 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 Iron Guard uh, uh, in some cases were violently anti-Semitic, but uh, it seems to be based on sort of traditional Romanian prejudice, like they were violently anti-Hungarian. They were anti. They were also anti-German. Uh, the German mm -hmm. minorities in Transylvania. We didn't much like, um, but you know, I I I I think it is in some ways sort of peculiar to traditional Romanian prejudice, you know, and living in a country with large minorities. <clears throat> um, they didn't they didn't have you know, by then they had Transylvania because they picked it up after World War One. So you have a lot of ethnic conflict, which is peculiar to the Romanian situation. I think it would be fair to say there was at least some mild anti-Semitism in most of these uh, these fascist movements, but it was not, uh, you know, a major current in, in them. Uh, the um, uh, movements in, uh, in France, for instance, were generally, uh, might say at least, at least implicitly anti-Jewish as well as anti-German. Uh, and you certainly get, uh, you know, one might say proto-fascist uh, in France, you know, rallying to the anti-Dreyfus, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the anti-Dreyfusel, the people against Dreyfus and the Dreyfus affair. Um, uh, although, although being anti-Jewish was not a particularly important element, uh, uh, as even Sternhill recognizes. Uh, <clears throat> the, um, uh, I think you also have to make a distinction uh, between, let's say, you know, fascist movements, let's say in a country like Hungary, uh, and you have a fascist movement organized in 1936 by a man named Gumbes, the name by the Gumbes in, in Hungarian means mushroom. <laughs> and uh, Gumbes creates this movement in Seged in Southern Hungary. And you have all of these people who join. They are uh, mildly anti-fascist. They also take over Italian corporatism. Um, but then you see these countries in which, uh, in, in, in Hungary by then, you had many Jews who joined the communist uprising of 1919 and supported Bela Kuhn's government. So that's why anti-Semitism becomes a feature, you know, of the fascist movement. Um, but, you know- so react, reacting to the communist element, basically. Right, the anti-communist element. But as I say, it, 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 it is not a necessary or particularly strong element in these movements. <clears throat> Gotcha. And I guess sort of uh, another question I have is, is I'll, I'll, I'll tie two, two questions together. So one thing is what was kind of the, the attempts and or failures of fascist internationalism? So like a, a friend of mine, uh, he, he enjoys <laughs> watching, uh, what would you call, what was his name? Oswald Mosley speeches, just because it like gets him fired up and whatnot. Uh, but it seems to me that the the Oswald Mosley phenomenon is uh, kind of typifies the failure of fascist uh, internationalism. So the ability to export fascism beyond the borders of Italy and beyond sort of what you could call uh, Latin Catholic 
not not uh, industrializing uh, countries, uh, it seems to be a real problem for the fascists. So they're they're never really able to break out beyond their zone. So what 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 would you say sort of explains that? No, I think I think this is true, <clears throat> and very definitely. There's there's several. One of the things I point out in my book is Italian fascists are Italian nationalists. You know, they're integral right. nationalists. They're not concerned with Romanians, right, or Ethiopian. Uh, and although there is an attempt to create a fascist international, uh, it's based on a narrowly nationalist concept of identity. So, you know, it's, it can be very hard. Whereas the communists have no trouble exporting this because they're internationalists, right? right. Uh, well, Christians have no trouble exporting because they're a global religion. So uh, uh, these people or the Muslims have, have no trouble. So, but, so the, the, the fascists have that against them. Second of all, you know, if you look at a movement like uh, uh, the black shirts in England under Mosley, they look ridiculous. I mean, they just don't fit <laughs> into English society. They do look like fish out of water. They really do. Right. I mean, what, what can you do? You're living in a Northern European Protestant society, stressing individual initiative, and, this, and you're running around looking like, you know, um, like Italian black shirts and singing Italian songs in English. So, I mean, it, there's just no fit there. <laughs> uh, uh, that, that's one of the reasons, you know, it's, it's not easily explored because it is... Uh, you know, it's like like creating British lasagna or something. It's just not going to work. <laughs> yeah, lasagna made with haggis. Yeah, right. <laughs> haggis. Uh, yeah, haggisagna. Yeah, I don't know. Make it a new thing. So I guess this sort of ties into sort of kind of my my final question before we get to. Um, I guess we'll we'll quickly go through the audience questions. I don't want to keep you too long, but um, to so the failure of exporting fascism internationally fundamentally is that it is a nationalist movement and to try and make nationalism international is kind of an oxymoron mm -hmm. yes and so one of the things that we uh see a lot today and uh <laughs> particularly in the news with antifa right anti-fascists is it always seems like if you ask anybody who's slightly left of center fascism's just around the corner mm -hmm. and we are just we are we are a, a hair's breadth away from uh basically being carted off to auschwitz for uh wrong think <laughs> by uh by a jack booted uh orange dictator in his 70s who took over the government of the united states essentially <laughs> uh so to what extent do you see fascism today if at all and uh, would you argue that in present times uh, is anti-fascism a more dangerous phenomenon? I think anti-fascism is a very, I think it's the most dangerous phenomenon that, you know, that faces free constitutional governments and free society, whatever's left of free societies anywhere in the Western world. I think it's terrifying. I do not see any fascist danger in the West. <laughs> as I point out in my book. I do see populist movements, but in Western Europe, I don't think they'll ever take power, and they're certainly not fascist. They're, they're democratic. I mean, they're the national democratic parties that are resisting mm -hmm. globalist elites. Um, I think anti-fascism anti is as great a danger as, as any totalitarian threat that Western society has faced. Mm. So it's, it's basically... The new communism, but worse because it embeds yeah. itself in society <laughs> and takes up everything. Yeah, if 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 you read the latest issue of Chronicles, which I'm editor in chief now, uh, I have a piece uh, response to my friend Bill Lind, who says that you know uh, the present left is simply a uh, a variation on Marxism. I say no, it is not. It is far more dangerous than Marxism ever has been in a Western country. There, there's just no. It's, it's just eaten away at everything. Uh, it has destroyed whatever vestiges of freedom uh, have been. It's, it's in the process of doing this. And if the Democrats win the next election, you know, the United States will become a totalitarian country. I, I think it is an absolutely frightening phenomenon, uh, anti-fascism. No, I would agree with that. And it's, yeah, comparing it to Marxism, if you compare sort of places uh, in the West that were subject to you could call it, uh, what was that? Sort of the, I think sort of the the prime example of this would be denazification. So it seemed, and this might be conspiratorial of me, but it seems like the Frankfurt School 
employed this denazification uh, process in Germany, and then a bunch of people who had possibly nefarious uh, uh, purposes saw how effective it was, and they began basically exporting that model to the rest of the Western world. So you sort of demoralize society, you teach them that their history is bad and so forth, and they, they're, they're horrible white males and they have nothing to be proud of and should you know, just open, open their homes to you know, the huddled masses of the third world. Um, it's, so that phenomenon seems to be very present in the West and it seems to have been started shortly after uh, the Second World War, and after the fall of communism, uh, it really, they just sort of hit the gas on it and, you know, dialed it up to 11. Uh, if you compare sort of countries in the West who have experienced that longest to countries which were uh, under communist, proper, like, Marxist control, the ones in Eastern Europe, uh, those countries tend to be a lot more socially conservative and whatnot. And it might be a conjunction of, uh, you know, Orthodox Christianity might have something to do with it. The, also, the sort of um, being sort of a peripheral border territory with the Middle East and sort of the ten historical tensions that went on there that might have something to do with it. But it, there can be no doubt that the uh, Marxist, uh, the actual communist influence on the long run for those societies has been potentially less damaging than sort of what we're undergoing right now. Are you asking me that as a question? Because I agree with everything you've just said. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> but uh, yeah, because I, I remember when I was in, um, this was in 2015, and uh, I, was, I was vacationing and I wanted to go to Eastern Europe and I went to uh, Prague. And I was just walking through Prague, you know, just sort of, you know, head, head in the clouds going through, I see this like mass protest. And then I see thousands and thousands and thousands of Czechs just like marching through the streets, holding up like anti-EU signs. And they have like a star and crescent with like the, like an X on it. And I'm like, and then, you know, I don't speak any Czech, but I was, I very quickly got, I'm like, oh, this is anti, this is anti-EU. This is anti-immigration. This is anti-Islam. And if you had anything sort of like this, with these sorts of numbers in the United States, it would be like a national travesty and a sure sign that fascism has returned to, <laughs> to the United States. So yeah, it's just really interesting seeing how in a certain way they're kind of like frozen in time uh, to a certain extent and the norms and mores that they have seem quite at home to what the US was like 30 or 40 years ago. Well, in a, ca a case of a country like Hungary, I think it's even more interesting because they were sort of like almost frozen. They were like frozen in an interwar <laughs> condition. <laughs> uh, if you look at Orban's government, now he does not say he's a supporter of the authoritarian leader, uh, Miklos Horthy, uh, who ruled, was the, the Hungarian admiral who took over in the interwar period, sort of an authoritarian leader. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, Horthy has been revived as a national figure. Uh, interestingly enough, both Horthy and Orban are Protestants uh, in a predominant. Mm. Catholic. Well, I think uh, Protestantism is the national religion in Hungary, the Reformed Church. Uh, it's, a, it's a national religion, although most of the people are, are Catholic. Um, and, uh, you know, he's always referring to the, the glories of the Hungarian past and so forth. Uh, it's as if, you know, and he's entirely untouched by, he says, we will never have any gay rights. We're a Christian country. We don't believe in any of this. We'll not have these people teaching. And they certainly aren't going to have parades in Budapest. Uh, and then, of course, we have the neoconservatives who I think want to invade Hungary because they <laughs> have, uh, I don't know, transgendered bathrooms there or things that are essential human rights now. Uh, yeah. but, you know, I, I, find, I find it amusing. Obviously, I sympathize with the Hungarians, you know, over the American global Democrats who want to bring gay liberation and feminism to these countries. Um, but the, uh, it, it is interesting how lit... East Germany, you know, is in something like almost frozen, you know, in a, in a time warp, many of these people. And even the members of the Communist Party were much more conservative than these West Germans who hate their country, who think, you know, that they have to erase everything, open the borders, uh, have, you know, wall-to-wall -wall gay rights and this. Um, uh, East Germans may have joined the Communist Party, but they also admired Bismarck, Frederick the Great, and Luther. 
uh, mm. people whose names are going are banned, just about banned in the present German Republic. <laughs> so uh, you know, I I think I think the communists were much more conservative uh, than the uh, you know the present in quotation liberal democratic leadership, globalist leadership in Western countries. Yeah, no, I would agree. And uh, just as sort of a for 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 the listeners, this is a this is an anecdote, but I think it highlights the 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 point quite well. Everyone will say, "Oh, these Marxists and whatnot with their LGBT stuff and transgender bathrooms and so on and so forth." It's this is, this is a Marxist problem. But um, <clears throat> I, I I always like to point out that I believe it was in it was sometime in the two thousands, but the Russian Communist Party actually <laughs> put forward a bill trying to ban uh, uh, basically criminalize uh, homosexuality. Right. And their reasoning for it was that it was a sign of bourgeois decadence. <laughs> no, exactly. I've written on this. Uh, no, I mean, no, bring these people back. They're great. <laughs> my conservative <laughs> perspective. No, the uh, uh, I, and one of one of my uh, one of my articles for uh, for Chron uh, on the on the Chronicles blog. You know, I quote Kay Guevara, who's attacking uh, uh, who's attacking homosexuals and feminists and. Castro with all these other people. Uh, this is supposed to be the left. <laughs> you know, that's, and they say, oh, these are bad people. You know, uh, This is our conservative movement. These are bad people. They're homophobes or something like that. Well, I mean, they sound like conservatives. The conservatives I grew up with, they sound exactly the same. You know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're not conservatives because they're homophobes. Very right, important. exactly. <laughs> All right. I guess we'll get to the audience questions now. This has been this has been tremendous. Thank you very much for your time, Dr. Godfrey. All right. So, uh, audience questions that I took down. So, <clears throat> as you know, um, I'm in South Africa, and this this question this is kind of related to sort of what we're talking about at the end. And um, one of my friends who's a South African, he asked me he asked me to ask you. Uh, how do we forge a stable order in a multicultural world that both rejects segre forced segregation and forced integration? So basically, it's like we don't want apartheid. Apartheid's bad, but we don't want the sort of crazy multiculturalism that we have now. And, and sort of how do you create and foster that in the modern age? There's only one solution, having confederations. Um, uh, regional autonomy. There's no other way to go. Um, uh, other, otherwise, you're simply going to have the globalist elites allied to the cultural radicals destroying everybody else. Uh, and the only way you save yourself from this is, you know, allowing people to secede and to form their own, you know, separate societies. Uh, by the way, I, I am not a supporter of some of the, you know, the Abbeville Institute. Secessionism is always great and so forth. Um, you know, I'm really of two minds about the Civil War. I mean, I can understand the nationalists and I can understand the, the Southern position. Um, and, you know, in, in the past, I think, you know, nation states were fine. I admire George Washington, Otto, Otto von Bismarck. Uh, I find much to admire even about Cromwell. Uh, you know, I, uh, I uh, uh, think that in its time, the nation state was marvelous. Uh, but we no longer have nation states of that kind. Well, we have our globalist elites, uh, managerial dictatorships, political correctness, uh, and you know, traditional Christians don't want to live in that, in that kind of society, and other traditional groups. Uh, I think, and you know, if you can do it regionally, if they have their own, you know, territorial uh, secession, or that is the only way it's going to work. Um, I, I'm afraid otherwise, the good people will be destroyed uh, because the you know the the globalist elites have too much power. The populists are not going to win in the end, <clears throat> and uh, you know the uh, uh, the the uh, uh, PC left and, and the uh, their woke capitalist allies and the managerial state are going to have numbers on their side, and they're going to win in so-called democratic elections, even if they're not rigged, which they may be in the United States if the Democrats win. So the only solution I see is territorial autonomy. <clears throat> mm. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And where I am right now, um, it's still kind of, it used to be not talked about at all, but it's gaining steam now. And there's an effort to uh, get Cape independence, basically, for the Western Cape. Mm -hmm. And um, for all sorts of reasons. Basically, 
the, the Cape has been colonized by one group or another for basically the whole time. And although, so it's, it's never really had a government that it kind of wanted. <laughs> Essentially, it's just been sort of hot, hodgepodge, like lumped into the rest of South Africa. And yeah, I think you're right. I think sort of pushing for regionalism is about the only way, only way to go. So uh, here's another question. It says, in your book, After Liberalism, you highlight the rise of the managerial state after the fall of authoritarian fascism and totalitarian communism. What opportunities, <laughs> I can tell this is written by a libertarian, what opportunities do you see for a classically liberal recovery from this, if any? <laughs> I see no chance of recovery. Let me be, let me be, be, be clear about that. But of course, the managerial state develops earlier than after the fall of fascism, or you know, the, the Soviet. It, it, it develops already in the. It, it develops by the early twentieth century, maybe even earlier, uh, and it is a product in many ways of mass democracy, urbanization, industrialization, and so forth. Um, I don't see it as you know. Um, the natural outgrowth of 19th century liberal nation states. <clears throat> um, uh, I, I think it, it represents a vast expansion of administration, <clears throat> um, which engages in massive social engineering <clears throat> of a kind that would not have been acceptable in a 19th century bourgeois liberal society or a more conservative society <clears throat> of the kind that existed in Central or Eastern Europe. Um, <clears throat> but I, I don't see... Uh, libertarians ever taking, I mean, I cannot even imagine them taking power. <clears throat> I mean, I'm not impressed that the Cato Institute has a lot of money. Um, they were totally innocuous uh, libertarian group, which generally goes along with everything the left wants on social questions, you know, and then comes up with some scheme for privatization or something like that. <clears throat> um, uh, more conservative libertarians of the kind you find perhaps in the Ludwig von Mises Institute uh, do not have that kind of success. Um, so, but in any case, I don't see libertarians as a group go going going anywhere. Um, uh, the left will only agree with them if they agree with the left on gay rights and transgendered rights and feminism and so forth. If they say, "Gee, let's you know, let's get rid of the government," or "Let's," they're not they're not going to go anywhere. No, no one's going to listen to them. <clears throat> yeah. No, I think that's the point. So basically, and yeah, that, that, that's sort of been my thing too. So as I, as I sort of mentioned in the beginning, I was, I used to be one of these bright eyed open, you know, and caps. And then as time went on, you know, I, I, I sort of got back into Christianity and then I had a family. I moved to Africa. <laughs> I read too much Paul Gottfried and I'm just like, yeah, the liberal order is over. <laughs> It can't come back, basically, it's for the dustbin, unfortunately, but uh, I think you're right. So uh, here's another question. Uh, do you foresee a withdrawal from the, so in the current sort of political tensions that we have in society, uh, do you foresee a withdrawal from the margins into two polar opposite groups being anti-fascism versus sort of anti-Marxism or sort of a, an anti-left uh, force in the future? Well, I'd like to believe there'd be an anti-left force in the future. <clears throat> my, you know, uh, my worries is we may not have enough numbers for that. <clears throat> and uh, I am very, very critical, as you know, of the conservative movement, not only for marginalizing me and destroying me professionally, um, <clears throat> but also because it does not represent any kind of serious opposition, except maybe at the fringes. You know, people are tolerated. If I read American Greatness website, for which I've been writing, <clears throat> um, uh, you know, they're, they're fine. You know, they, they, some of these people do get onto Fox News and so forth. I like at least some of what Cucker Carlson is saying, uh, but he's dependent on these uh, neocon sponsors uh, and sometimes says stupid, dumb, sort of stupid leftist things like America's founded on equality or something like, or nonsense like that. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but I certainly like his attacks on, on the left. I just don't think we have the numbers to make any kind of difference in the end. Uh, the left is much better organized and the left is much, um, much more spirited um, and much less timid. Uh, one of the things I've been noting about the American conservative movement, I have this a piece 
called athumia in Greek, which means having no courage, uh, an American greatness. <clears throat> all, all of my Trump neighbors, pro-Trump neighbors, avoid saying they're for Trump. They do not put up Trump signs. Um, maybe at most they'll say we support the police. Uh, the, uh, the Biden supporters uh, or the left supporters, most of whom are in their 60s and 70s, um, they have signs all over the place. They have, they have you know, rainbow coalition flags flying from their houses. They represent maybe 5% of the community. Um, mm. I, gi I give them credit. I mean, I despise their beliefs, but I give them credit because they have courage. And it's not that you say, gee, you know, they're the majority. No, here, they're not the majority. They're a very small minority, you know, and yet they, yet they are willing to show you what their convictions are. Um, I just don't think we have a conservative movement that's gutsy enough to make any difference. Um, I know I see these people at the Trump rallies. I don't know how much you can, you can count on them. I think a lot of it's sort of a cult of personality. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I wish we had a conservative movement in the United States uh, that had the determination and the courage uh, and boldness that I see in the left, which I think is thoroughly evil. I think they're evil. They're as evil as the Nazis in the end of the day, but they have courage. They have determination. And that's one of the reasons that they win. Yeah. No, I, I would agree with that. And I guess sort of the, the thing that uh, sort of my, my understanding of kind of anthropology and one, it seems to me that these kind of, um, who's, I was, I was going to say the cultural hegemon, but I, I think that's the wrong term. It's, it's this, that, that concept came up by Louis Althusser, the, um, uh, I, I forgot, but is, basically. Is it Gramsci or Althusser? I'm not is sure. It <laughs> it's not <I>, Althusser. <laughs> No, it, it's a, it's about the uh, uh, but, cultural hegemony. Yeah, yeah, cultural hegemony. Yeah, yeah, basically. So, but there's this other term. I think it was by anyways. Forget it. <laughs> but yeah, cultural hegemony. So I think you're right. I think the the left is really sort of fired up, and they do have the gumption. But I think it's partially because the cultural hegemony is on their side. So even if they are a minority, um, they are <clears throat> empowered in their own minds they're, they they have a massive morale boost because everything around them is telling them that what they're doing is saving the United States from fascism. <laughs> Whereas, you know, conservative people, you know, traditionalists and reactionaries, they get the impression rightfully so that, yeah, you know, if, if I open up my mouth too much and say, you know, I don't really like g gay pride parades in my town, they'll be ran out of town on a rail. So I, I think there's, I think that really has a lot to do with it. Yeah, but then you also have to explain <clears throat> why in, in, a, in an area in which the, the you know which conservatives outnumber the other side ten to one or even more than that, the the left is running around to say I'm gonna boycott your store and people are terrified. They start you know quaking uh, in fear. I lose ten bucks. Oh shit! <laughs> you know, I, I mean I've never seen such cowardice, uh, and this has always been my sense, that, except for these people on the alt right who'll say anything they want and, you know, in their grandmother's basement, you know, on, on yeah, their uh, computers or something. It doesn't make any difference. <clears throat> um, no, I, I, one of the questions I keep asking is why doesn't the right organize something little like a boycott of Vaseline in the ad where the person has a big, big BLM, you know, sign and she says, you know, and I'm living in a racist society. Well, we're not going to use your Vaseline product anymore because you're encouraging a terrorist organization. You know, there's m many examples. We won't drink Pepsi, Pepsi Cola uh, because they support Ant Antifa. Uh, let's organize. Now, the left, on the other hand, we're, we're, gonna, we're boycotting Indiana because they wouldn't put up enough uh, transgender restrooms. Boycott a whole state, yeah. <laughs> right, That's right, a whole state. And, oh, we're, we're scared. We'll have to give, give in to them. I, 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 th I think the people who join the right are either careerists, like, you know, the kind that you see in Conning, Conservatism Incorporated, uh, or they're just people who are b very timid by nature. Um, so the, the, um, the other thing I think is true is lots of people who side with the right, um, you know, are, are more concerned about family or going to church or something like that, you know, and really don't want to get involved in these political wars.
Uh, the, the other point I, I, I always make is, how is it that the left is in control? How do they take control? You know, <laughs> where were these people on the right? <laughs> they probably had the majority at one time. The answer is that, you know, the, the left are, are more engaged <laughs> in what they're doing. That's you know, true. they set out to take control and they, they were successful, not only here, but in every Anglophone country and throughout the so-called Western European in quotation, liberal democracies. <laughs> no, that's absolutely true. All right, uh, next question. Uh, da, 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 All right, that was the classical liberal one. <laughs> so we answered your question. <laughs> uh, da, 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 da. Okay. So this this goes to sort of what you were talking about earlier with regionalism and confederation being sort of the only real. Mm -hmm. uh, viable option. Uh, there seems to be an infatuation among certain sectors of the right, mostly online. These are these are sort of fringe people. Um, with the I, there, there, there's an infatuation with fascism, in the sense that not necessarily that they necessarily want to mimic the, um, the 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 program necessarily to a T. But there's there's a, a respect for it in that it was kind of a uh, an organized, blatantly authoritarian way of dealing with the left, and they like that, <laughs> basically, and, and I like that too. Uh, so I guess sort of, do you do you consider this either a dangerous development, or do you think that it's possible that the alternative for confederation, like you were talking about? is sort of a Caesarism scenario. Well, I'll sort of get, get back at your <laughs> things you raised. There was somebody reading my manuscript on anti-fascism <clears throat> and the editor, who's, who's a friend of mine said, uh, this person who read it said that I must be very fond of Italian fascism uh, because it's like I, I, I had to force myself to say bad things about it. <laughs> 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 they were talking about how dynamic they were. Well, I think it is inevitable that anyone who looks at the careerist in nebbishes in the conservative movement here or the British Conservative Party or Macron or God help us, uh, Merkel in Germany, who's a <clears throat> disgusting leftist kiss up, you know, pretending to be on, on the right. If you look at any of these people and then you look at Mussolini and the march on, they, they did they did do something <laughs> against the left. They, they were victorious. We do nothing but lose, <laughs> you know? and or, 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 or we, we have these losers on our side, or sort of a paid accommodationist opposition. Uh, you know, these people were. You can't help feeling like that. I do not apologize. I feel that way too. I mean, even if this ended disastrously, <laughs> at least they tried to do something. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> um, uh, you know I, I'm sort of like thinking of the bold gestures. Now, if I were in this, this Republican Party, which is mostly worthless anyhow, but if I were in the Republican Party, <clears throat> unless the Democrats win, you don't say, gee, you're the victor. We're going to cooperate with you. And if Joe Biden, we're, we, we accept this bill and we're graciously, but we're, no, you behave exactly like the Democrats. I give them credit for what they did. You, you, you go after them. You go after them day and night. You try to derail the government. You try to destabilize them. Uh, you try to embarrass them in the Senate. You never stop doing this. You do this every single second. This is the way the right should behave. Um, as this fellow who's the Z-Man or something, I had him on some, had him on some podcast pointed out. Yeah, yeah. Right? You imitate. You do exactly what the left is. You, you always should be as resourceful and as ruthless as them. This is what the opposition should be doing. You're not a paid accommodationist uh, opposition. Uh, we, we used to have in uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut, where I grew up, a man named Ed Sandula, who ran the Republican Town Committee. Uh, and uh, they were the were the, sort of the paid opposition to the Democrats. He go, oh, you know, we already prepared his concession speech. The other side won. We don't it's want like a heel in wrestling. We don't, we don't want Ed through. Sandula opposition. I, you know, it's just like seventy years ago. Really, I still remember this. We don't want that opposition. You know, we, we, don't, we don't quite want Mussolini, but we want something more like Mussolini than like Ed Sandula. You know, we don't want it. We don't want losers. And we don't want people who are paid losers, you know, accommodationists, um, 
uh, who then very often, like David Froome and Jonah Goldberg, join the other side. You know, they just go over to the other side because they give them give them a bigger, you know, give them more money and a nicer contract to work for them. Uh, you you want people who are committed to the war that you're in. You're in a war, and you know, uh, even though we haven't started shooting, but there is a war going on, and you have to understand the war that you're in. Uh, and you do, there, there, there's one lady on Fox News. You ever seen Martha McCallum? And she is, uh, Dana Print, these sort of the women who sort of like lean a little bit left and they drool with delight if they have some, I don't know, black nationalist on there or something. Like, you no, know, you don't invite these. They're, they're your enemies. You don't invite them onto your program. The ones who are their enemies are people like me, you know, who tell them you should be fighting a war here. We are the enemies, you know, it's, it's not your real enemies. So, uh, you know, you can't help but admire the revolutionary nationalist of the night. I mean, I can't. Uh, you know, I try to hold it back when I write. <laughs> but at least in the early days, this looks, you know, this looks this looks promising. <laughs> what a virulent force for, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess that's the, um, that's fundamentally the thing, is that the uh, conservatives, they sort of believe still the liberal notion that we're in a, We'll have a, a we'll engage on the battlefield of ideas. We'll have this out in debate, and uh, you know the the best ideas always win. Whereas the left have embraced the Schmidt idea of friend enemy distinction. <laughs> right, <laughs> that, that's the big difference. Like if you if you look at it, that's that's basically the big divide. Is and and you know of course you know they hate Schmidt and whatever, but but they recognize this fundamental point. That they have enemies and they're trying to destroy them, <laughs> whereas the conservatives, you know, the, the erstwhile conservatives and uh, classical liberals and whatnot, they're they're like, no, we'll we'll have this out. We'll 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 act like we're you know in some cafe in Paris in the uh, post-revolution, you know, talking about the the Girondins versus the you know the Jacobins and arguing over the finer points of like liberal theory and how high this tax rate should be and you know, so, but the left, they really understand the friend-enemy distinction. <laughs> well, I, I, I go beyond that. I think the, the conservatives are not as good, you know, as the uh, uh, the Girondists who were wiped out by the Jacobins. They, they're, 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 what they've done is they fight a ruthless war against the right. They shoot everybody in their own trench, you know, in order to be able to surrender to the other side or make, make deals with the other side. They're even worse than that. Mm. Um, I don't see. Th think they're sort of like, uh, you know, detached uh, intellectuals with their head in the, in the clouds. I mean, these are, are, are in some ways ruthless careerists, uh, but they're not committed to victory for the right. And they're not, many of them are not even on the right. Uh, so, you know, they, they, with, the, with the move, I, I always compare them to the uh, Vichy France or something, you know, to the uh, collaborators, the German collaborators in World War II. I mean, they, 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 this is the closest they come you know, to being any kind of op opposition. Um, and we don't, you know, you don't, th these people are a major part of the problem uh, that, you know, we have not been able, that we have not been able to generate a serious, uh, and they've gone along with most of the, of the serious things that the, that the left has done, right? I mean, they've, uh, the immigration reform of, of, of 1965 was great. Uh, even the, uh, the Voting Rights Act in the United States had the effect of radicalizing the country um, by by mobilizing a, a by then radical black vote, and you know it was it was it became triple it was tri it was tri tri became triple of what it had been before. And areas of the country were forced to generate black votes in order to show they were not being prejudiced. And this is not a racial attitude in my you know uh, I always tell people I would have been happy if we never passed the Nineteenth Amendment and women weren't voting. Because this too has radicalized the country, and we have to sort of see where yeah. we're coming from. Um, and I'm neither I'm neither against white, against women. Certainly, I'm married to one. I'm not against blacks. Or the, but you see, oh, right, you, <laughs> right, you cannot radicalize the electorate. This is what you get. Uh, so yeah. Oh, I was just saying. I think that's a very, very good point. I was. Uh, I think it was actually in. It might have been in the American Conservative, but. There was this thing, there was an article talking about how are we in, um, it says like, is, is America like in, 
Spain before the Civil War. And there was this line, uh, it was a quote in it, and it was this guy who was, at, this reporter who was asking a guy in Basque territory, uh, what do you think about Franco? And then his response was, Franco, you know, the government's Franco's concern. I just fish. Like you got that his, for me. That's my line. <laughs> the person was, yeah. quoting me. <laughs> okay. See, yeah, I'm quoting. I don't even know it. Yeah. Yeah. The, it was told to me. It was told to me by uh, uh, by, um, by 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 somebody who had visited who had, who had uh, Thomas Molnar who had visited Spain at the time. And this fisherman says, you know, I don't care what the government does. I'm just a fisherman. You can do whatever you want. But but the government was not particularly oppressive. It didn't affect your life very much. So, I mean, that's uh, <clears throat> that's fine. Uh, yeah, the comparison to the Spanish Civil War overlooks the fact that we have nothing like the Spanish nationalist. Uh, you know, we're yeah. going to fight the left. Uh, the, ours would just run to capitulate and then get them to fight the people to on their right, you know, <laughs> with a real yeah. danger. <laughs> No, that's true. And there's that, that sort of reminds me of another article I read in uh, First Things recently. I think it was called like Liberal Suicide or Suicide of Liberalism. And it was talking about this very phenomenon in the, I believe it was the 1907 Russian Revolution where you had the liberals are trying to, or the, the, uh, the country is going through all this turmoil and the czarist regime is like trying to make concessions. They, they went to the liberals and they're like, look, we'll grant you all your sort of economic concessions and whatnot. Just mm -hmm. please sort of get on board with the program. And their attitude was like, no, burn it all down. Yes. They're, so the, the, it, it always seems that they're they're quite happy. Like they, they oppose the left in theory, but they're very happy to just sort of burn everything down on principle, I suppose. <laughs> it's, it's weird. But anyways, uh, so I got a couple, just a couple more questions for you, Dr. Gaffey. Again, thank you very much for your time. Uh, says, Orwell wrote to Malcolm Muggeridge that the real divide in society is between authoritarianism and libertarianism. Do you think this statement was correct? No, I think the real division is between right and left. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, you, 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 you quoted Carl Schmitt, and as you know, I'm a biographer of Carl Schmitt, and uh, while I don't entirely accept his ideas, I think he's a profound political thinker. He's the most profound political thinker of the 20th century. Um, uh, but, you know, I, 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 I don't think it's libertarians and authoritarians. Also, libertarians never go anywhere. You know, yeah. <laughs> I always forget. You know, it's, it's, it's sort of like saying it's, it's between... Uh, uh, the left and butterfly butterfly collectors or something. I mean, they're just they're just just not an important political force. No, I would. Agree. All right, next uh, <clears throat> question. I only got a few more. So it says, "How did the Frankfurt School affect the understanding of fascism in the West?" Well, <clears throat> I think in the early days, as I this is you know uh, the, the book, long book I just finished on anti-fascism. Uh, I think I think I think in the, in the in the early days they had profound influence, <clears throat> um, mostly through the, the work of the authoritarian personality that came out in 1950, <clears throat> which talks about the fascist personality and pseudo democrats who are really fascists under the skin. How America is now the major breeding ground of fact. This has profound influence. Uh, but one of the points I make in the book is we've gone well beyond the Frankfurt School. <clears throat> Um, in the way we have pushed what used to be called cultural Marxism, uh, contemporary political correctness is much more extreme. <clears throat> For instance, um, the, uh, the Frankfurt School, uh, certainly the first generation, people like Adorno, Horkheim, Marcuse, Eric Fromm and others, uh, would have recognized that homosexuality is deviant behavior. That's what, that's what they said. <clears throat> um, mm -hmm. They never would have supported gay marriage or gay liberation or anything like that. They also were not against, uh, you know, mommies and daddies and sort of like traditional families. They just wanted, I suppose one might say, sort of first wave feminism or, you know, the early feminist movement in America, like in the 1960s. Uh, they, 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 many of them were, in fact, extreme socialist <clears throat> on economics. But on cultural and social issues, as I say, they were probably somewhere to the right of the uh, of Fox News and the Republican Party right now. 
So <laughs> I'm not joking. Uh, by the way, as you know, Herbert Marcuse was my teacher, and I've written widely on the Frankfurt School. Um, and they were not as radical as, as you know, uh, contemporary cultural politics have become. <clears throat> mm. Now, next question. Uh, da, 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 da. Was okay. So this is a little, a little bit of local flavor in here. Last two questions are sort of local questions. So, was the apartheid government seen as fascistic? And if not, how was it different? No, it, it was not. It was not fascistic. It was just engaged in a holding action. It was. It was sort of a very mild uh, right wing authoritarian government. Um, uh, you know, and it had it had a uh, an impartial judicial system. Uh, I, I was never a violent enemy of the apartheid system. I, I think I think uh, my major objection to it was when they had a chance, they should have divided up the country. Yeah, uh, you know, and uh, they should have also allied themselves with friendly black uh, groups. Certainly, the Zulus would have been on their side. <clears throat> uh, so uh, they did not take opportunities that presented itself. Um, and uh, particularly in the apartheid system of Milan in the beginning, they were rather rigid, <clears throat> um, but they, they certainly were not running a fascist government. Yeah, no, I, I think that's correct. So it's like they, they, had a, they had a golden opportunity to make something really great right. <laughs> by basically cutting up the country. But yeah, it, ultimately, I think they just they were too grasping. Right. right. So when they got control, they wanted to hold on to all of it <laughs> instead it, of. It was more okay. than that. I mean, you know, they would not part with, uh, you know, black menial labor and black. They wanted yeah. them to work for them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was not, you know, th th this could not go on forever. <laughs> yeah, no, they, they wanted their cake and they eat it too. That was that was the problem. So it was it was grasping. They wanted to hold on to everything and they wanted to exploit the, the cheap labor without sort of having to deal with the social ramifications. Right. So, uh, yeah, I think it would have been a great opportunity. And I think they sort of did a lot to sort of marginalize and make a lot of bad will with, uh, you know, the, the people that they rub shoulders with. Like, like I said, my, my in-laws are, uh, are, uh, colored, but, um, I think there's, that was a big, big, big missed opportunity. And the national party could have done a lot to make this, you know, what is now South Africa, a really nice place to be by sort of encouraging sort of local rule and not trying to hold on to everything and, you know, <laughs> making this mishmash. But they, they could yeah, have, made, you know, they could have made, made an alliance with the colored um, against the Zosas, who were their enemies, uh, you know, let them stay in, you know, they're going to be on your side anyhow. <clears throat> I mean, there were any number of opportunities which they missed. Uh, this doesn't make them fascist. It just means they missed opportunities. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Uh, so I guess the last question I have for you, Dr. Gottfried, is can, uh, this was written, can Dr. Gottfried commit on the, all right, I'm going to try Afrikaans now. Ready? Okay. Can Dr. Gottfried commit on the Osa of a Brandtwach movement in South Africa during the Second World War? Yeah. Uh, some of these people did try to make an alliance with, uh, with Nazi Germany, uh, but it was, I don't think it was really based on ideology so much as hating the Brits. Uh, you know, some, <clears throat> some of these people did remember the Boer War and the British treated them horribly. They put these people, they put uh, Afrikaners in concentration camps. They killed many of them, um, <clears throat> you know, and they just invaded their, their territory. Uh, and although there were later attempts, one might say, to, uh, to make peace, and, and there were people like Smuts who even during the First World War, I think, supported the British. Um, most of the Afrikaners did not like the British, you know, in World War One, they supported, most of them supported the Germans. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, some of this lasted into World War Two. And I think there is an attempt made, you know, to use the war again, to, to use the German war against England again in the Second World War um, to drive the British out. <clears throat> um, I, I, I think one can one can exaggerate the ideological component. <clears throat> um, uh, there were people like all over the place who were willing, you know, to do things like that, like, uh, you know, Egyptian nationalists. You found them all over the place. And you say, well, they were really Nazis. No, they were not. They were making alliances. There were also Indian nationalists who wanted to lie with the Axis in India. So, um, uh, you know, I say, well, you know, they, they're basing it on whiteness or something. But the uh, the whiteness wasn't quite the same as Nazi ideology. 
uh, the South African government did not round up Jews and put them in concentration camps or anything like that. So um, I, I, th I think I think one one can exaggerate the the ideological similarities. I think it was mostly an alliance based on hating the British. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. Because <laughs> even even now, um, like I have, <clears throat> I'm, I'm like the American, I just show up, I'm like, hey, guys, like, you know, I, I didn't have anything to do with anything. So <laughs> I make friends with all kinds of people. I got Africana friends, I got uh, British uh, friends, I got colored friends, black friends. And um, the thing that I've noticed is, um, yeah, there is, there's still, <clears throat> still, uh, in sort of more conservative uh, Africana community, still a little bit of Ah, the British. Yeah, but the ones, <clears throat> the ones that they are okay with, uh, are they? They don't like the sort of colonial type in Cape Town, or whatever. But the ones they are pretty cool with are the uh, sort of the rural farmers that you found, like the eighteen twenty settlers in like uh, in East London and whatnot. And they also happen to be quite a bit more <clears throat> conservative and Christian and whatever. So they're basically like. Rhodesians, essentially, in the in right. sort of their temperament, so they always got along better. All right, very much. Well, I think that is everything. Let me just double check. Yes, that is all the questions. I can't believe we did it. Fantastic. All right, all right, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, <clears throat> in closing, I would also ask that if you have not subscribed to this channel, Mister Patriarch, I would highly encourage you to. Please, please, please. I like to make this into a side hustle and use it to uh, put food into my kid's mouth someday. That would be nice. <laughs> and uh, also, for those of you who do not know, Dr. Gottfried is co-host of a wonderful <clears throat> YouTube channel, which I have been following for some time, called Cado Gottfried. I would highly encourage you guys to check that out. Again, that's Cado, C-O-T-T-O, -T -T Gottfried on YouTube. He is also the uh, editor-in-chief, I believe of Chronicles Magazine. <clears throat> they have a great website with tons of articles up there for some like real non-con ink rightist, <laughs> real conservative sort of material. Definitely check out Chronicles online or subscribe to a subscription. Uh, I'm not sure if I could get the magazine here in South Africa, but I'll definitely look into it. <laughs> please do. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> please do. And, and the same for all of you. All right. Thank you very much. And that will be it for this evening. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you. Uh, Bye.